let well enough alone. Silly bone, come and sit and dance. Silly bone, come and sit and dance. Silly bone, left a glance. Silly bone, I'm on your dance. Silly bone, guiding friends. Silly bone. Hello everyone and welcome to Laugh First shoot later um this is the um latest of our uh, podcast focusing on the western genre and we thought this time we'd take a little um a little trip over to something a little more light-hearted after um what's been a pretty tough few months for most of us for um, one degree to another um we'll be looking at comedy westerns this time um, two words that don't often go together and can often produce pretty poor results. So we've cherry picked a few here that we think um, may represent uh, the uh, the best of uh, the bunch. Um, I'm joined today by um, Mr. Kevin Lyons, the editor of the Encyclopedia of Fantastic Film and Television. That's e o f f t v dot com. Uh, you can see the web address there below him. And also uh, Mr. Kevin Grant, the author of um, Any Gun Can Play, which is a um, probably the greatest book um, available on the spaghetti western genre. Um, he also co-authored um, with myself, uh, Renegade Westerns, where we looked at um, uh, left field westerns made in the USA and also the author of Vigilantes which looks at the whole um, uh, history of vigilante movies in the cinema from the western to um, right up to the present day. So the first um, comedy western that we're going to look at um, it's a bit of a no-brainer. There were a few um, comedy westerns made and back in the good old vintage days. Um, Buster Keaton made one. The Marx Brothers have made one. I think uh, Fatty Arbuckle has made one. So, um, but we thought we'd go straight to uh, our favourite comedy duo, Laurel and Hardy. And the film was made in 1937 by James W. Horn and it's Way Out West. I thought I told you two dudes to catch the next coach out of town. Yes, sir. Well, it left ten minutes ago. It did? Well, maybe we'd better try and catch it. We'll get it. Right, 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 right. right. We'll get that deep, or I'll eat your hat. Eat it. West was made by uh, Hal Roach Studios um, and this time Stan and Ollie are, um, have to deliver a deed to a gold mine to a young lady in a, in a western town um, and being the uh, city billies that they are they end up having the deed to the gold mine taken off them by a, uh, by a gold digger and her ruthless husband played by James Finlayson um, Basically, Stan Laurel has it has him <laughs> has it taken off him through intense tickling. So it's <laughs> one of the funniest um, movie scenes I I can ever 
recall. Um, it's a really, really delightful film, and it has some of the, um, uh, Laurel and Hardy's most famous skits. Um, I can only go over to you, Mr. Lyons, because I know from the box set in the background there that you are a massive Laurel and Hardy fan. Uh, well, who isn't? I mean, anybody who isn't isn't worth talking to. So, Bad yeah. people. Um, <laughs> I mean, this is just, to be honest, we can stop here. I don't think it gets any better than this, to be honest. This Maybe is you know, the pinnacle of the comedy western for me. It's amazing. Right from, you know, from that silly little dance routine they do near the start through through the song. Everybody loves the song. Um, yes. With the, with the greatest, the best timed comedy feint at the end of it you'll ever yeah. see, oh, where Stan gets funny. his on the head. And he, he just that split second where he looks more perplexed than ever and then very slowly just disappears out of shot. Absolutely marvellous. The, the film, the film is, is brilliant from beginning to end. Like you said, the, the tickling scene is incredible, but it's got some great dialogue as well. People think of Laurel and Hardy and they think of the big sort of um, slapstick set pieces. There's some great dialogue. There's a wonderful bit where they're first introduced to this gold digger and they don't realise yet that she's not who she's... They, they think she's the grieving daughter of this yes. man. And she said, oh, tell me about my daddy. Is it true that he's dead? And Stan deadpans, well, we hope so. They buried him. <laughs> <laughs> we hope so. They buried him, yeah. <laughs> I've written that one down here as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's one of the great comedy lines. And of course, you know, he, he was hugely influential as well. Even, you know, into, into the 70s, Bud Spencer does that thing with the, the thumb and the, the yes. um, light in the fire with his thumb in The Sheriff and the Satellite Kid. So it was one of those films that I think, you know, whole generations of filmmakers grew up remembering and many have tried to copy it. Most have failed. Yeah. No, it, I mean, it's a film I, I remember, you know, from my childhood, mm. Laurel and Hardy would be on television a lot. Um, I guess when, you know, we're, we're all of a similar age, so they were, they, they were on television a lot. And that's um, one of probably the most memorable um, Laurel and Hardy film. I don't think it's their best film, but for so, some reason it, it becomes the most memorable. Um, like you say, so many routines, like the um, when they're trying to hoist <laughs> Oliver Hardy up onto the roof, <laughs> and then in the end it becomes a battle of wits as they're, uh, <laughs> they're, they're <laughs> pulling the rope and then just dropping each other. When you um, say a battle of wits, this is Laurel and Hardy. It's not much of a fight, really, is it? It's no. Like... Maybe a yeah, battle of the witless, maybe. So, uh, <laughs> Mr. Grant, what do you think of Way Out West? Yes, I love it. I love it. Um, it's easy to see why it's one of their most um, treasured uh, productions. Um, I think their their particular charm in, in this one really shows through because they're completely guileless, both of them, mm. in a cynical environment. You know, the cynical world of the West. And then there's, there's these two... Uh, hapless characters who are, you know, they have um, they have only this girl's best intentions at heart and then they run into the, the ruthlessness of uh, James Finlayson and, and Sharon Lynn as, uh, and his other half um, and so you're always on their side, you've got that, that, that charm they bring to all their films um, the routine, the beautifully engineered the dancing scene um, Trail of the Lonesome Pine you know, the, the spontaneity the spontaneous way they join in with that song. Um, it's just wonderful to behold and it seems so typical of them. Um, there's some great stand moments to enjoy the happy team scene when he actually has to eat Ollie's hat. <laughs> what, what I love about that scene is how long it takes Ollie to realise that it's his hat that stands eating. It, take, <laughs> it seems to take an extraordinary amount of time. Anybody else, the audience is way ahead of them. And Stan, um, Ollie just doesn't get it. It takes him so yeah. long to understand that this, this is his hat that's being eaten. Yeah, yeah. And also yeah. the amount, and then also it, it dawns on Stan that he quite enjoys it. <laughs> 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 the other really, really great thing that I spotted this time when I saw it was um, when Stan... Uh, meets the, you know the girl the rightful the, the daughter of the, who is the rightful um, inheritor of the deed and he goes in behind that glass door to tell her what's been happening and he basically 
mines the entire plot <laughs> of the film, including the tickling. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. It's it's a brilliant comedy moment. And of course, Stan lent a hand to, to the scripts and the production mm -hmm. of these films. I mean, he was a brilliant comedian. You know, yeah. Oliver, Oliver Hardy was happy to go along with it. But, um, you know, Stan Laurel book did come up with some really, really mm. brilliant comedy skits. Mm. Um, you know, unforgettable. As, as, um, as Kevin was saying about the, the influence of the film, um, we see it even later in the, um, uh, they call me Trinity. You know, mm. the opening of that with the transom is, uh, you know, must be a, a homage to the opening mm. of Way Out West. You know, we even have Trinity being dragged through water. It's like Ollie gets dragged through water. Yeah. In the beginning of Way Out West. So, yeah, it's influenced, um, you know, lasted for decades and decades. And the song, of course, became uh, a number two single in the UK in 1975. Yeah, bizarrely, it was. That's that. Well, that's why. Maybe that's why it's so. Um, it, you know, it's mm. it's marked us so much. Is probably because when we were little kids, it that song was released as a single. Maybe the film was being screened over and over again at the time. I, I don't know. Any road, any road. Uh, the next film um, that we're going to look at is. Um, it was released in 1952, uh, directed by Frank Tashlin, um, and it stars Bob Hope, and the film is called Son of Paleface. I'll soon be flying higher than a kite Because tonight's my night to have a wing ding There'll be real fine doings tonight Barry, this kid, he's dead. What's the matter, don't you like girls? I'll stick the horses, mister. Horses? Horses? <laughs> Horses? That's ridiculous. Son of Paleface, is, the, the plot isn't dissimilar to Way Out West in so much that um, our, uh, the character, our character played by Bob Hope, um, is a is a eastern greenhorn who goes out west to um, to inherit his daddy's fortune. This time, of course, um, Bob Hope's motives are purely uh, purely selfish, as opposed to Stan and Lock, Stan and Ollie's. Um, however, um, his character finds that um, actually there is no money, and he's stuck in the middle of a town with uh, a lot of people wanting a piece of that action. Um, including um, Jane Russell, who's incredibly funny in this film um, and is in a, in a uh, bandit gang called The Torches, um, who are also very much interested in this uh, supposed fortune. Um, so, um, Mr. Grant, that's uh, Jane Russell. She's quite a gal, isn't she? Indeed, yes, yeah, quite a handful. <laughs> <laughs> she is. Um, and do you have any opinion on the film? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I couldn't really get past Jane Russell. Um, <laughs> no, it's uh, yeah, it, it's. I do. I very much enjoy both payoff based films. Um, they're both very fast paced, uh, very silly. Um, the the uh, Bob Hope persona, especially in this one, is not especially. Well, there's nothing noble about him at all. In fact, you know, he's, he's like you say, he's a very sort of greedy, self-interested character. But um, the gags that he comes out with, um, thick and fast. You know, they don't always hit their mark, but there are so many of them. You know, you just can't help can't help but surrender to it. Um, and uh, the whole film, it's, it's it's relentlessly mocks the expectations the audience would have had of a hero in the western. Um, so that not only is, is he shown up by Roy Rogers, uh, who's based a straight man, 
um, but also obviously by Jane Russell, who's completely dominating throughout, and he's even bested by Trigger the horse at one point. So you know, but, but there's there's self mockery as well. I mean, Hope is oh, yeah. is um, he's got this absurdly exaggerated costume that he wears at one point, for example. You know? Yeah. Um, and it's interesting that the film takes Roy Rogers comparatively seriously. You know, as the straight man, um, utterly chaste, noble hero. Um, so that was the model of, um, sort of Western heroism, certainly in the 40s, um, in the B, B films of the 40s. That the film was kind of working against with Bob Hope. Bob Hope just had no time for any of that nobility. Um, that's what I like about it. And also, the sight gags really show up. Frank Tashlin was an animator for Looney Tunes. Okay. Uh, earlier on in his, in his career, and that you can really tell, really adds something, a really zany quality to the movie. Yeah, yeah, it's, there are, it, it is pretty zany. There's a lot of kind of, I w not quite as, I think the lo um, Way Out West is probably more of a surreal experience. But the, but like you say, the, the, the jokes are very qu quick, very, very fast. Um, he remind, it reminds me a bit of a Groucho Marx, actually, in the sort of um, mm. delivery of his of his lines um and uh yeah it is and it's a nice it's a very colorful film it's a really fun film to watch and like you say it doesn't overstay its welcome um and what do you think of it miss lines you uh did you like son of pale face I'm, I'm a huge bob hope fan um this is bob hope being bob hope for an hour and a half i mean it's it's as kev said the 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 speed of the humor the speed of the jokes is so fast that you don't even get time to register i didn't think that one was funny because here comes one you do think is funny mm. it's just this sort of bombardment the whole time of all these gags one after the other and he was a real master of that and he'd sort of perfected that by this time and we even get this lovely little throwaway gag right near the beginning where one of his more famous on-screen partners puts in a very brief uncredited appearance because mm -hmm. he's not going to be in this film and you know it's, it's things like that the kind of knowing sort of he was confident enough in his audience at this point to know that they would get these or put up with these very silly sort of self-referential yeah. throwaway gags and then you you get frank tashlin who as kev said was an animator so he he was more than aware of, of how to sort of marshal all of those sort of self-aware jokes and the little in jokes and surreal moments yeah it's a, it's a wonderful film the pale face is good but this is a very noticeable step up from that i think mm. yeah i think he refers to bing crosby as an old character actor on the paramount that's Park, right yeah. yeah 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 <laughs> and he's really he's only mentioned just so that he can say he's not in this film which is in itself very funny you know the yeah. fact that the, the only reason he brings him up is to tell people no you know bing's not in this one so. well, although of course he is Okay, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> very Maybe that's the gag, actually. He, 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 he's in it, but um, in it, very but briefly, yeah. yeah. He's, he's in it dis despite Bob's best efforts, really, yeah. <laughs> so um, this is the first of our um, Euro-Westerns of the evening. Um, and when I say Euro-Western, this isn't, um, you know, your typical... Uh, Western that's um, filmed in uh, southern Spain with an Italian crew and and uh, and um, dubbing and a Morricone soundtrack. We've got one of those later, but we'll talk about that later. This um, is a 1965 released film. Um, every um, every British person is brought up on these these films. It's just it's part of the curriculum of life over here. Um, directed by Gerald Thomas, released. 1965, it's Carry On Cowboy. Many of the greatest films of all time have had as their background that vast, lawless territory known as the Wild West. Yahoo! Many magnificent spectacles, many epic stories have come from this fabulous land. But this is Carry On Cowboy. I wonder what they wanted. I thought I heard shots just now. Uh, it's probably just a horse backfiring. Sidney James as the notorious Rumpo Kid. I am the mayor. You better keep away from my horse. He ain't seen a mayor in three weeks. Kenneth Williams as the mayor of Stodge City. 
Jim Dale as Marshal Peanut, the sanitary engineer they sent to clean up Starred City. Charles Hawtrey as the Indian chief, Big Heap. Floor to the pale faces! This is my new squaw, Kitty Cater. I bought her for two buffalo skins. How? Never mind how. Where? Joan Sims as Belle, who ran the saloon. Johnny, she's no good. Take it from me, she's after something. You take it from me, if you get out of the way, she's gonna get it. Yes, this is the Wild West, where men are men and women are... You all know what that means. The night is young, and we're not too old. Angela Douglas is Annie Oakley, a helpless damsel in distress. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I, I thought you were somebody else. Yes, it's another hilarious hit in the fabulous Carry On series. Big Chief in Little Lodge. Right. A smash hit by Peter Rogers and Gerald Thomas who have made Carry On the hallmark of the very best in comedy entertainment. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I know it's the Wild West, but <laughs> this is ridiculous. Carry On Cowboy, we have... Um... Our usual crew of carry on actors. Um, Sid James plays the, um, the Rumpo kid who enters Stodge City. Who enters Stodge City? Oh, you started already, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Lyons. He started already. He go it's not subtle, but the Rumpo funny. kid goes to Stodge City <laughs> where he ends up running the saloon. Um, and uh, also, um, heads up a gang of, uh, of cattle rustlers and um marshall peanut played by jim dale <laughs> arrives in town and despite the fact that he isn't a marshal of the law and marshall is just his first name ends up putting the badge on putting a badge on him and having to defend the town from the rumpo kids uh, wrongdoings um there's so many gags in this. I've written a couple down. So we've got, um, so Kirby, Kirby Jones Sims plays the part of Bell Armitage who runs the saloon. When you enter the saloon, you have to hand your gun in and uh, the Rumpo kid hands over his gun. And what does she say? My, but you've got a big one. <laughs> <laughs> and then it just descends from there. So, um, Mr. Lyons, could you please give me uh, um, your academic take on um, Carry On Cowboy? There's no academic take on the Carry On films worth a damn. It's, it's just brilliant. It's not the best of the Carry On films by a very long way, but where else are you going to see Sid James as a gunslinger? Where else are you going to see Angela Douglas as Annie Oakley? You know, I mean, it's, it's completely mental from beginning to end. Kenneth Williams as the mayor of an old West town. I mean, it's, yeah. it's the most unlikely casting of any, any film ever, surely, even by the carry-on standards. This is just completely nuts. And like I say, it's not the best of the carry-on films, but when the jokes hit, they really hit really well. And you've got to say, you know, that supporting cast. I mean, look at them. There's John Pertwee, Bernard Breslau, Sidney Bromley, Adina Rone, Peter Gilmore. Every one of the supporting cast in this one is a recognisable face. You may not know the names, but they're those kind of people that turned up in British cinema all the time in the mid-1960s, and you know them instantly from your childhood. Mm -hmm. And it's just just watch it just for the cast just having the time of their lives kenneth williams didn't like his carry on films he was always very negative about them always quite disparaging but not this one he liked this one mm. he liked the humor and he liked the warmth of the characters in this one yeah, yeah. it's sort of interesting because like, like i said i don't think it's the best but he is exceptionally good in it and and sid james i mean it just I, after, after 30 seconds, I was buying him as an Old West hero. 
you know it just yeah, worked yeah. it was perfect it was wonderful you know well i mean the thing that they do in this film um that they don't they don't particularly do in their other films is they actually put the accents on you know they they're do, actually yes. yeah they're yeah. actually a acting yeah. with these sort of american yeah americanized accents i mean they're not they don't particularly hit the mark all of them but that that gives it that they're, they're, they're trying to make a western um yeah. you know a, and they're the trying western to subvert the western as well i think there's you know the, the fact that marshall appears to be the hero you know even the townspeople think he's the hero but actually it's annie that does all the work she's the real hero but she's sort of keeping that yeah. quiet for his ego as much as anything else so under, underneath all the silliness, there's actually a, a little bit of subversion going on as well, which is rather nice. Yes, yeah. And um, Mr. Grant, what do you, uh, what's your take on Carry On Cowboy? Well, as, as you've both been saying, um, it, it works best um, through its casting, the, the comic incongruity of the casting. Um, and, I mean, what, I think what I liked about it the most in that um, was uh, Charles Hawtrey, as the um, Native American chief, um, who makes no effort whatsoever to speak with a, you know, with an inflection, he just, he just Charles Hawtrey <laughs> dressed up as an Indian chief. <laughs> the power that he wields, it's just hilarious. That's <laughs> it's just so bizarre, um, yeah. and that that's reason enough really to watch it because you know, in terms of plot, it's it's recycled from many other. Yeah. You know, end, endless westerns. I mean, in fact, um, you know, it's on a pale face with the uh, sort of hapless hero um, shown up by a, uh, a woman. You know, it's the same thing here. Mm. Um, and um, but it's it's really the casting to see the, these great comic performers. You know, no one no one would have won an award for this script. Um, mm. But there are so many puns and double entendres. Um, enough of them are going to raise a smile. You know, to get you through the um, just the silly or the duller parts, you know. Uh, I have to, to disagree. I have to disagree, Mr. Grant, when you Please say do. no one's going to win a no one's going to win an Oscar for this script. Um, I've written it down. They got away with fifty cows, bullocks. Now I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Genius! <laughs> I surrender. <laughs> oh, <brilliant. laughs> but you're going back to the Charles Hawtrey thing. He plays the he plays the Indian chief called Big Heap, and Bernard Breslau <laughs> plays his son Little Heap. But Naturally. Course, Naturally. Yeah. And the one scene that I I loved was um, when Charles Hawtrey um, declares there's a gold rush to clear the bar out, the saloon out, then starts to drink all the alcohol off the table, and he's really so drunk that when um, Sid James walks back into the saloon. He walks past him, and Charles Walker is just legless. He goes, "Oh, hello!" <laughs> <laughs> it's a classic, a classic Charles Walker moment. <laughs> Brilliant! It's and the terrible Christmas, and it's hilarious. <laughs> the terrible puns even extended to the poster. The poster tagline for it was "How the West Was Lost." Yeah. So the, the puns even went into the advertising. <laughs> it's, it's just yeah. it's hilarious. Not the best, but hilarious. It is. It's it's good fun, and I'm not a, a big Carry On fan. I like I like bits of them, but th this was a nice a nice film. And like you say, it had a it had a nice feel to it. It actually has a nice feel to it. You know, the characters, the good characters are, are, are nice. You you really root for them. So mm. yeah, it's kind of cute. Um. Same year, this time. Um, this is a film that was released in 1965 by Elliot Silverstein. Um, it stars Jane Fonda and it's uh, Cat Baloo. Well now, friends, just lend an ear, for you're now about to hear the ballad of Cat Baloo. Cat Baloo, Cat Baloo, Cat Baloo. She was the queen of the outlaws, her highness Cat Baloo. Miss Parker didn't introduce us, I'm Catherine Baloo. I'm drunk as a skunk. 
You all say you love me and are beholden to me and, and take it easy, cat. We're going to take care of you. And the first time I ask you to do one little thing for me, like rob one little tray. No, 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 hold on, man. Listen, Miss Malou. Now, ma'am. Whoa! Uh, a horse ranch idiot, a drug and gun fighter, a sex maniac, and an uncle. Hey. Oh. Some gang. Lee Marvin as the drunkest gun in the West. Oi! Michael Callan as the maniac. Dwayne Hickman as the uncle with the good book. Tom Nardini as the noble red man. Nat King Cole, Stubby K. Jane Fonda as Cat Baloo, girl train robber. Wow. Okay, you open up. Nope. Now come on now, open it. What's wrong? He won't open say, says he'd rather die. Is that right, mister? Yeah. Seven left, 26 right, 14 left. Come on, jump. 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 Yeah, yeah Cat, Cat Baloo, uh, it's a lovely uh, film, lovely western. It's uh, directed by Elliot Silverstein, um, who dabbled in all sorts of genres. And I think, I think the only other Western he may have directed was A Man Called Horse, which is a, a very different proposition to Cat Ballou. Um, and Cat Ballou tells the story um, of a fairly naive young lady, Catherine Ballou, who goes back to her um, frontier town um, after being trained as a teacher um, to find that her father's uh, land, uh, or her father is being um, threatened um, by local a local bigwig um, uh, to remove him from the land, and um, eventually her father is um, killed by uh, Tim Strawn, who's played by Lee Marvin with a metal nose attached. Um, after he lost his nose in in a fight because someone bit it off in a fight, and Cat Ballou basically. Um, basically gets uh, hooks up with a, a sort of surrogate family, I would say, um, uh, two, two outlaws and an ex, uh, well, a, an aging gunslinger who has a little bit of a drink problem, who is uh, also played by uh, Lee Marvin. It's a really, really uh, quite mm. lovely film. It's got a nice look to it. The opening credits are lovely. Um, the songs from... Um, uh, Nat King Cole and please help me here, Mr. Grant. Stubby K. Stubby K. A very nice, like a Greek chorus, keep uh, mm -hmm. telling us what's going on with the in the plot. Um, what do you think of uh, Cat Blue, Mr. Grant? Um, yeah, it's uh, it, it's an interesting film to watch. Um, in retrospect, a lot of the um, a lot of the time, well. Its sentiment um, is easy to associate with Jane Fonda in retrospect. You know, it's all about you know equality for sexes and races. You have that aspect running running all the way through it. It seems quite quite sixties, you know, quite um, uh, in line with, with those sort of trends in sixties um, counterculture that it was coming. Um, but there's also uh, it's also clearly in touch with, with Western tropes. The um, redemption of the, the drunken gunman, you know, uh, we can trace that back to the Rio Bravo, for example, among many other films. Yes. Um, and it's also, um, it, it's quite subversive in its own way, in that Jane Fonda, as Captain Lou, starts out reading about um, Lee Marvin's character in a dime novel, and imagines him as this great, you know, shining hero, as all the dime novels portrayed there. They come. And then we see the reality of this totally worn down alcoholic you know has to be um so i thought that was quite nice because the uh, it, its take on myth making in the old west 
Mm. Um, there's a lot of slapstick at times, but also a strong current of um, sentimentality for the ways and the myths of the old West. And I think it, it sort of looks towards other semi-comic westerns of the late 60s, like um, the Good Guys and the Bad Guys and Support Your Local Sheriff, things like that. Um, where it, it, it's sort of subverting the old ideal, but it also has a lot of um, fondness for them. You know, and I think that that's, that comes through in uh, the treatment of the Lee Marvin character. Mm. Yeah, well, um, yes. I mean, it, it it sort of starts with a story about this this um, this young lady who uh, who's um, you know who goes back and ha has this work. It's quite an awful tragedy, really. It's a very gentle comedy. Um, but but it does become the story of uh, of this this old gunman's redemption to a certain extent. You know, he he does become a bit of a, a surrogate father to you know they they've kind of formed this unit, don't they? Um, after she's lost her father, I mean, what what do you think of it, Mister Lyons? Did you, did you uh, like Cat Blue? I'm gonna. I hate to do this, but I'm going into grumpy old man mode. I I wanted to like it more than I did. Hmm. It just didn't. There were a lot of boxes that were ticked. Yeah. You know, those of Lee Marvin, Jane Fonda, Nat King Cole, all people I absolutely love. But I don't know, it just never, never really took off for me. It never really caught fire. There was no sort of. Mm. It's not a bad film. It just sort of starts and goes along and then it finishes. And by the end of it, I'm no sort of. I'm not particularly excited about anything I've seen or heard in it. And I'm not quite sure what, what the problem is. I mean, clearly it's a, it's a failing on my part not to see, but I'm not sure what it is that I'm missing, to be honest. I, I don't know. I mean, but for, me, for me, I don't think it's a, a, a laugh riot and I don't think mm. it's, it's a great Western. I'm probably, um, but I think it's somewhere in between. Sure. You know, I think sure. it, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a comedy Western, definitely. It fits the bill. Mm -hmm. um, but, may, uh, but maybe there were, there's a lot, there are a lot of gags that they they could have put in that that they missed out on. I mean, the funniest thing really is Lee Marvin's drunk horse. You yeah, know? <laughs> Lee Marvin, yeah. but yeah. both turning up drunk. Look, I think they're are they leaning against the wall, uh, mm -hmm. drunk or something yeah. Yeah. with the horse. I think but, that uh, may be it. I think I wanted it to be more riotously funny, hmm. as Kev said. It's kind of gentle comedy. And there's certainly a place for that. I I, I like gentle yeah. comedy, but in this, I think I was expecting something a bit more. I don't know, just a bit yeah. brasher yeah. than I got, yeah. and I was just a bit disappointed. I didn't dislike it. I didn't hate it. I will watch it again quite happily. But it wasn't. It wasn't the film I was expecting it to be. I think. Yeah, yeah. I think that's uh -huh. that's fair. It's it's kind of caught between two two stools. You know, it's mm. not it's not it's not wacky. It's not laugh out loud funny. Um, and there's also a lack of dramatic tension, really. Mm. Um, but it was very, very successful worldwide. Hugely popular, um, yeah. One of the ten highest grossing films mm. in the US and the most successful Western of that year. So That's right, yes. At the time, it certainly you know, struck a chord with people, yeah. perhaps more, more so than today. Our next film was something of a um, celebration in, um, of the Europe, uh, European Westerns. Um, I think it was the highest grossing European Western up until the point of its release. Um, it was directed by Enzo Barboni, who was the um, director of photography on Django, and who had previously released a uh, Western called The Unholy Four, which was quite a dark, brooding Western. And the film we're going to look at next um, is 1970s, they call me Trinity. They call me Trinity. Hey, Trinity. They say you got the fastest gun around. Is that what they say? What's going on here? Brothers. Yep. Same mother. 
Well, I'm not looking for trouble. Well, they'll be stiff before they can draw. You're still quick on the draw, I see. But I bet you'll manage to mess things up on me. I don't know how, but I'm sure you'll do it. I suppose you got nothing to do with this, right? No. Who's got the time? I'm already busy doing that. With the restless gun. I advise you to watch the deputy. He is very fast. You hear that, Mortimer? The Major says the deputy's very fast. They offended the law. They said I was a son of a no. That is. Sir. How are we gonna settle that? You gonna handle it alone? Sweet dream. I just woke up. You take your share. Pardon me, brother. Can I go to bed or you got something else planned for tonight? Well, I really came for a drink. West cool. I don't think so. They call me Trinity. Um, I would say really, although our two stars from this film uh, had made films together before, they call me Trinity, starred uh, Terence Hill and Bud Spencer, and probably launched the career of the most um, lucrative comedy duo um, ever in, in Europe, possibly. Um, it tells the story of uh, two half-brothers, um, Trinity, who's played by Terence Hill, who's uh, a bit of a saddle tramp um, with, uh, with his grand burnt granddad top and his braces, and his um, portly um, brother, um, Bambino, played by Bud Spencer. Um, Terence Hill's um, real name was Mario Garozzi. He was um, from Venice. And uh, Bud Spencer's real name was Carlo Pedasoli, and uh, he was uh, he's a Neapolitan and a former Olympian swimmer and a giant of a man um, and makes great contrast with uh, Terence Hill, who's a far more lithe and athletic, um, charming character. Um, together, they made a great comedy duo. Um, I think just quickly to start, Mr. Grant, how did um, Hill and Spencer get to this point? Well, they'd already formed a very successful um, partnership on screen in three Westerns directed by Giuseppe Colizzi, beginning with um, God Forgives I Don't, 1967. Um, and they, these, weren't, these weren't outright comedies, but there was certainly a pronounced ironic quality to them. And, um, yeah, that, that physical and temperamental contrast that they had between them, the big burly guy and, and then uh, Bud Spencer and, um, um, yeah, the more slender, cat-like Terence Hill, just just proved very, very, very popular, certainly in Italy and right across Europe. And, and here they were um, in, in Trinity, um, an all-out comedy, and just, just went stratospheric. I think it's the second most successful film in Italy that season. Um, yeah. yeah. Influential. Mm. Yes, yeah. Now I was looking at um, statistics for um, film attendances in Germany and uh, I think it's either they, they call me Trinity or Trinity is still my name. It's still in the top 10 of, of, of attendances at, at cinema. So people actually going to see the movie and they are huge in Germany. You go into a video shop in, in Germany, their, their films are in the Klassische section of video <laughs> shops. There, there were, uh, Bud Spencer particularly is um, a hugely popular actor there. In, in Hungary, there's a Bud Spencer Museum that's been uh, opened in, um, in, in Berlin. Um, yeah, so as you say, it's stratospheric. What do you think of... Uh, um, they call me Trinity, Mr. Um, Lyons. Well, 
I'm going to get run out of town for this or possibly even lynched at high noon, but I'm not a big fan of Spencer and Hill. Yeah. I do like this one. I think yeah. this is my favourite of all the ones that I've seen them together. Yeah. But there's something about their comedy which really doesn't connect with me at all, I'm afraid. Mm. Um, comedy is the hardest thing in the world, isn't it? I mean, it's so subjective. What's flat out hilarious to one person is just completely deadly dull to another. And... I don't know Spencer and Hill. Mm. I just I just find a, a very little Spencer and Hill goes a very very long way, but in this <laughs> one I think they're very good. I think at this this stage they're still sort of finding their way with this kind of kind of humour, and I think a lot of the other films I've seen were much later, mm. and it was a bit. Oh yeah, it, it seemed a bit sort of a bit rote by you know a certain yeah. part of their career. It was a bit sort of. Oh, it's the same old routines, the same old slapstick, the same old, you know, whatever. But this one, it, it felt like they were engaged as well. They were energised in this one much more than, so than perhaps some of their later films. Yeah, I think so. I mean, th this is the film that, that, that starts it all. And of course, mm. the, like you say, it becomes, it, it, be, it can become repetitive. It's, um, I mean, I, I watched a, a whole load of them with, with, my, with mm. my son and he, he loved them when he was little. I mean... They're, they're, it's 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 slapstick with with mm. you know with the um you know with a little bit of violence and um and ridiculous villains one thing i that about them um that is a recurring theme in each of their films is that they all they're always fighting for the common man against mm. bullies and that's like that's a recurring theme in a, in a hill spencer um mm. film um I mean, this film also has um, Farley Granger in it as as the villain. He's the he's the villain. He's he wants to get to take land from a from a religious community. Um, and this this happens in in another in another western we're going to look at in a moment. Um, what I mean, what do you make of it, um, Mr. Grant? Do you do you, do you like um, the Call Me Trinity or? I do, I do. Um, I completely agree with, well, I think what, what Kev says is very fair, you know, the, the films, the, towards the beginning of their, um, their partnership, Star's partnership, um, have a, a freshness about them, um, you know, that, that couldn't last forever, and they made so many films together, you know, kind of inevitable that some of that charm uh, will be lost along the way, but, but this one um, is a lot of fun. Um, Enzo Barboni wanted to, to send up the what he saw was the innate absurdity of spaghetti westerns. Um, for example, Trinity's preternatural skills with a pistol, for example. Um, it's just just a, a comic exaggeration of, of the kind of um, you know the kind of super, almost supernatural skills that spaghetti western gunfighters seem to have. So that was that was in Barboni's mind to send all that up. Um, among other things, and uh, it's a peculiar um, fascination with the eating of beans um, perhaps began here, uh, certainly in terms of Italian comedy westerns, the fagioli westerns as they were called, um, oh, yes. yeah. and that seems to have been picked up on perhaps by Mel Brooks <laughs> in Blazing Saddles as we'll, we'll see a little bit later. <laughs> Not yes. the most sophisticated form of wit, certainly, but uh, no. has its well, place. That the, the, that initial um, see that initial scene with, where Terence Hill goes into that that little sort of makeshift saloon, and they they bring him a plate of beans. Well, they bring him the pan of beans. Apparently, he starved himself for nearly two days for that scene, which is why, <laughs> you know, in every subsequent Hill Spencer Western, they they just have this big eating beans scene you know um um i i think bud spencer is very funny actually i think that this the sort of um that sort of exasperated growl that he has when he sees his his ne'er-do-well brother um, you know it, he's just fed up of seeing this guy turning up ruining his life you know over and over again um it, it's um I, I think it's a lot of fun and that my favorite I think going like we concentrate on on the film specifically rather than than them as a as a double act throughout their career. This that um, there's a scene where the, these Mexicans 
um, turn up and they're they're bullying. I think they're Mormons, but I think they're they're, they're bullying them and they're knocking them out and dropping them down. And Bud Spencer's standing in the line with the, with the Mormons and he sees the guy coming and he's, you know, he knows full well that as soon as that guy comes up to him if it, and he pokes him or pushes him, he's just going to, boom, he's just going to do the Bud Spencer wallet and the guy's on the floor. That's a particularly good, because it, it's, it's timing. And you can see it coming, and Bud Spencer knows it's coming, and he knows exactly what he's going to do. So, yeah, I think it's delightful, and they, they beat up the bad guys at the end, um, and they don't kill them. They just beat them up, and they just send them packing, and it's I think it's quite a pleasant little little thing. It's a bit over long. It's nearly two hours, though, isn't it? Yes, yeah. That's yeah. Like both the Trinity films are, are a bit over long, to yes. be honest. Yeah, which is a surprise, because most... Um, most spaghetti westerns around would clock in about ninety minutes, so yeah, it's quite quite a long time. But I, I enjoy it very much. Um, so moving on with our um, spaghetti western uh, lineup, uh, there were so many spaghetti westerns that were made in the wake of the Trinity films, and many of them were were, were awful. And um, Mr. Grant will have seen. You know, researching for your spaghetti western book, you would have probably have exposed yourself <laughs> or been exposed to. <laughs> been exposed. <laughs> so, a really big difference there in phrasing. You know what? Yeah, be very it's all right. This is edited, but I'm not going to take that out. <laughs> most <laughs> you will have been exposed to some of the most boring spaghetti westerns that were ever made because most of them are dread. Like you say, that they're they're um they're, they're just copies upon copy of the trinity of the the terence hill bud spencer um double act and then they're just not as good they're not as charming are they as as no. hill and spencer that's the difference um so we we picked something out that we thought was was a bit of fun which is um a film directed by julio petroni and released in 1972 now petroni directed to Pepper, which we looked at in our last mm. podcast, and he wasn't a particularly prolific director, but he made some very, very good spaghetti westerns. This one um, isn't one of his best, but but it's quite fun. It's um, sometimes uh, life is hard, a eh? providence. <laughs> Con dolcezza ed impazienza. Chi ti bacio? Eh? Provvidenza! <ride> a un tiro frontale. Permesso. S'il vous plaît, mon père plus mon sac. Eh? Se non ti comporti bene, non ti porto più fuori a cena con me. Buongiorno. Oh. 
sarei molto grato se non dicesti d'animo vivo della mia visita qui. Missione speciale, capito? Sì. Sometimes Life is Hard, A Providence, um, stars um, the great Thomas Millian as uh, a uh, bounty hunter called Providence who dresses up as, as it appears, uh, Charlie Chaplin. And um, his sidekick um, is the Hurricane Kid, as played by um, Western uh, stalwart Greg Palmer. So... Providence is basically an eccentric bounty hunter who has a um, converted um, Wells Fargo stagecoach to travel round in. And um, the beginning of the film, most of the beginning of the film is basically a spin on the good, the bad and the ugly um, motif of Providence turning in the hurricane kid, then rescuing him. So he turns him in for the bounty, then rescues him um, and goes on from there. Um, it's a series of just bizarre moments, quite a lot of surrealism. Apparent, apparently, Thomas Millian um, was suggesting scenes left, right and centre. Uh, Millian, I think, was um, probably during one of his more inebriated stages in his career. Um, but actually some of them work, some of them are just so peculiar and odd that it, you just stick with the film for that 90 minutes and you think, well, that was peculiar. Um, and I quite like it, it's quite a lot of fun. Um, what do you think, uh, Mr. Grant? Yeah, it's, I mean, it, it's um, stands or falls, according to your opinion of Thomas Millian. Um, I mean, I love Thomas Millian, you know, I'm a big fan. Um, and he just really sinks his teeth into this role. Um, completely dark. Uh, and um, it, it's not surprising that, that you say that he you know, suggested a lot of the scenes and routines himself. Um, because because he, he's just completely at one with the role. It, it's thoroughly bizarre. Um, I would imagine that, that he was a big fan of silent slapstick comedy. Um, he, you know, he indulges that throughout here. Um, there's perhaps an in-joke in there somewhere where I think they go into a um, sheriff's office and there's a reference to a miscreant with a tall, fat brother. It certainly has me thinking of Trinity and Bambino, the characters in oh, yeah. the Trinity films. Um, I, I would take that as a reference back because um, given the title um, has a biblical connotation, providence. So did a lot of other Italian comedy westerns that follow the Trinity films. You have Hallelujah, you have uh, Amen. Um, you know, there was nothing um, subtle about where the um, uh, inspiration was coming from. And but this is this is fun. It's, it's like you say, it's, it's borderline surreal at times. It's got a wonderful Ennio Morricone theme tune. Uh, Petroni was a very versatile director, clearly. Um, Death Rides a Horse was his, his first spaghetti western, one of the all-time greats. And um, this is about as far away from the movie that film as you could possibly hope to get. Mm. Yeah, he, he didn't seem to have a particular um, mood or style of, or vision of, of, of the world as a director. He just he he just seemed to get get a project and then make make the best of it and i think he's made the best of of what of this very weird idea but with the best actor someone who could really pull it off i mean there's a little little so i think he's he's providence is sitting on the stagecoach and he's he's doodling or he's writing and the hurricane kid says something and providence turns around and says i am writing to my mummy which is not what you would ever get. No, no Western Western hero would ever say anything as peculiar as that, would they? What did you think of it, Mr. Lyons? I did like this one. Um, like you guys, I'm a, I'm a big Thomas Millian fan, which helped no end. I'd like the relationship between Providence and the Hurricane Kid. I thought, you know, I like the quirkiness of the characters. There isn't really a story 
to be honest. It just kind of, it's a series of escapades. Um, some of them are weirder than others. And I kind of like that. It's kind of, you know, it was sort of mm. refreshing just to have this sort of, there was no big serious points being made. It was just lots of very eccentric things happening with this wonderful central performance. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, big thumbs up from me. I enjoyed this a lot more than I thought I would. This was the first time I'd seen it. And I was like, no, you know, I like Thomas Millian, but, you know, is, is this really going to be for me? I don't know. I think I think I was thinking of my my sort of, not dislike, but my not exactly my love for Spencer and Hill. And I was thinking, oh, is it going to be more of the same? And it wasn't. It was very different. And, uh, yes, yeah, yeah. I enjoyed it because of that. Yeah, and it, it is, like we were saying, it is very difficult to pick out um, really really good fun italian comedy westerns as, as mm. you know as there are with with comedy westerns in general but there were so many that were made in italy after the trinity film and this one does throw a bit of a curveball at you yeah. you know um the, the like the scene of when the, the hurricane kid going to take a bath in the river and all the all this sort of black dirt comes up and then all the fish start bobbing dead fish start bobbing you, you have polluted the river you know it's just <laughs> such a bizarre character providence such a bizarre character but, but um brilliant but i think um Millian was certainly um becoming more and more eccentric as that mm. decade wore on mm. um especially in the in the more popular genres mm. you know he was getting free reign to do more and more bizarre things um, so we've come to the last film now. I think if people mention, you ask most Western fans, what is your favourite Western comedy? Um, most of them would probably refer to this one. Um, 1974, directed by Mel Brooks, and the film is uh, Blazing Saddles. Torn from the fiery pages of the mightiest annals of the West comes the supreme saga in the great tradition of frontier drama. Francis. He wore a shining star His job to offer battle To bad men near and far What's your name? Well, my name is Jim But most people call me Jim Well, do your best Now let's see where were we? Oh, Rock Ridge. Rock Ridge. I want that land. Clumsy fool. I'm sorry. Wait a minute. There might be legal precedent. Of course. Land snatching. Let's see. Land. La land. Sea snatch. Ah. Hello, handsome. Is that a ten-gallon hat? So just sign this, yes, sir, right here. Oh, okay, give us a hand here. All right, sir. Work, 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 work. Okay, folks, let's wipe them out! The heroic sheriff rallies his citizens in the wildest finish the West has ever seen or the movies have ever shown. Ow! Oh, ow! Have you ever seen such cruelty? Blazing Saddles, um, as I say, was uh, released in 1974. Um, it's sort of the, the ultimate in a genre pastiche. The, the plot um, loosely um, focuses on a, a railroad man who wants to um, divert uh, a railroad through the town of uh, Rockbridge. And um, he wants to drive the 
who wants to drive the inhabitants out basically by doing something that will offend them so much that they can no longer live there. So he uh, hires a, um, a black sheriff who's played by Cleveland Little. Um, Cleveland Little was um, in Cotton Comes to Harlem and he was also super soul in the brilliant uh, road movie Vanishing Point. Um, and uh, it, it, it's probably the most riotous comedy on, on this list. Um, there are there are gags here and there. There are racial jokes. There are Jewish jokes, and you know there are there's uh, there are sexist jokes. You know it's not for the um, easily offended. Although I think everyone is equally offended, and and um, of course um, it's it is the sheriff who's the hero of the piece. So you know let, let, just to clarify that it it is a great film. It's a great deal of fun. Um, what do you think of it, Mr. Lyons? Do you enjoy Blazing Saddles? Oh, love it. It's a wonderful film. And I think the people who are most offended by it are the people who haven't seen it, who've heard about no. it second or third hand and have jumped to some kind of conclusion. You know, this, this is very much an anti-racist film. There's a, yeah. a lot of racial epithets in it, but it's, 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 it's the, like you say, the hero of the piece is the black sheriff. Every white person in it, with the possible exception of Gene Wilder, who, second to Sid James, is probably the least likely gunslinger in the world, but he's still magnificent. <laughs> Apart from him, every one of the white characters in this film is is an absolute moron and is never portrayed as anything but. You know, they're, they're intensely unlikable people. They're horrible. And... Yeah, it's, it's a wonderful, clever, and it's much more nuanced, I think, yeah. than people will give it credit for. People will just see it as this sort of crude, they're throwing the N-word around sort of thing, mm. which I know Mel himself has felt uncomfortable about. But no, I think it's, it's, it's a very nuanced film. There's much more going on in it than initially meets the eye. Yes, uh, yeah, and, you know, we are, we're talking about 70s cinema here, that, mm -hmm. and in certain... certain parts of you know certain areas of, of 70s cinema were certain words were thrown around mm. quite i mean you know cotton comes to harlem you know it's it would be a, a black exploitation movie so you know cer yeah. certain language was used that uh, perhaps not used in films today but that's um yeah well, i mean that's going that's... The, the, let's not forget that richard Pryor had a hand in writing the scripts yeah, and Brooks has claimed many times over the years that he consulted very closely with Pryor and Little through the writing and yeah. directing stages as to whether he was going too far or not, or whether he's doing the right thing. And apparently, they were both sort of urging him on. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, very different times. And I think a lot of people, like I say, they get very offended by, it, but they haven't actually watched it. Yeah, they just well, heard Pryor, about it. Pryor was it, uh, originally in line to to be cast That's in right, the film, yeah. but um, he was. Um, experiencing a number of drug busts, I think. At the time. I think um, he was he was not a well man at the time. So it was too um, much of a liability for for the studio. Too too yeah. too too, yeah. too much of a risk, I think. Yeah. And apparently, even John Wayne was considered for the role of the boy. He, he was offered <laughs> it, the but he said no because it, it went against the family image he wanted to present. But apparently, yeah. he did tell Mel Brooks, "I'll be the first in the line to see it." Whether that's oh, okay. true, whether he actually did turn up to watch it, I yeah. don't know. Um, he, he's no comedian either. Um, no. What do you, <laughs> Mr. Grant? What do you think of um, Blazing Saddles? Yeah, it's a um, completely audacious movie. Um, hit and miss for me, you know. Um, but mm. I think, that, like we, we we've said before, in relation to um, some of the other movies, uh, it's so fast moving. I mean, there's so much material being thrown at you and it, it, it covers so many angles um but yeah as Kev was saying earlier on you know there isn't time to pause the thought like you know you, you're just carried along um by by Brooks's completely outrageous conceit um I think it works best as, as a satire of, of uh, racial attitudes um a wonderful scene the welcome sheriff scene when the townspeople line up welcome their sheriff who's going to be their savior um and then they're just you can almost it's almost like in a cartoon you see their jaws drop mm. and, you know, <laughs> clang and cleveland little rides up um it's completely wonderful 
um, that scene. And uh, I think Cleveland Little was, um, he was just superb in this, you know, very yeah. laid back, yeah. very natural. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's such a shame. I think he, he, I think he died, you know, very young um, mm -hmm. in the 1990s. Yeah. Um, you see, he, he really, really carries this film effortlessly. And there's all this mayhem around him, all this absurd overacting um, around him. And he's this, this quite calm center. You know, it works, works really, really? well. Um, and I like the I like the in jokes, uh, the casting of um, Slim Pickens as mm. uh, as a guard, you know, uh, utterly utterly crude Western stereotype. Um, the references to Randolph Scott, you know, all this wonderful all these wonderful references. Now Randolph to, Scott. Yeah, you do it for Randolph Scott exactly. <laughs> um, all these this, this. So there's there's clear there's clearly affection for uh, the classic Western. But um, also acknowledgement that so much about Westerns in general um, is right for uh, parody. And uh, yeah. you know, Brooks gets a lot of that right. Mm. Yes. So there's some great dialogue. You, you, I think, you know, you, we all remember the, the, the beans and the campfire scene. Everybody remembers that bit. But the bits I always remember the most of the dialogue, there's some really funny scenes in it. The, the I shoot with this hand scene. Yeah. You know, when they're talking in the um, in the jail and um, especially when they first meet, we're very confused. I, I love that whole dialogue exchange where, where you know, sort of the kid is sort of upside down in his bunk and um, Bart comes in and says, are we all right? And he kind of looks at him and says, I don't know. Are we black? He says, yes, we are. Yeah. Then we're okay, but we're very confused. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Very and you know, I can't, I can't deliver it the way Gene Wilder does it. It's, it's all in the delivery of that line. Yeah. Yes. What, one of my favourite scenes, in fact, my oh, the completely favourite scene is um, uh, Lily von Stubb's dance, the uh, Madeline Kahn's that the Ambord dance, and she is the you know the <laughs> saloon girl, the the glamorous saloon girl doing this dance, and she is pissed off board with the whole thing like really <laughs> absolutely think, brilliant routine i think it kind of loses its way a little bit at the end is my only sort of big criticism of it it sort of loses focus a bit when we start sort of traveling into the modern day and they go start watching themselves at the cinema it kind of yeah. feels like the focus sort of shifts a little bit and it's kind of like oh yeah you've sort of run you haven't got a way to end this you don't know how to end this film Mm. And you're kind of flailing about. But up until then, the first two thirds of it, more than two thirds of it, are absolutely yeah. brilliant. It's just that ending doesn't ruin it, doesn't spoil it. It's just a bit. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's yeah. it's anarchic and it's it breaks yeah. the fourth wall and it does all of those things. But it probably didn't need that. It might have just no, needed wrapping no. up with a with a gunfight or a custard pie fight in the town or something. That's but, right. Yeah. 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 Otherwise, yeah. it's a masterpiece. Mel Brooks clearly had, um, you know, more more ambitions than, than mm. merely to send up the Western. Um, but w yeah. whatever, you know, it, it worked wonders. The most mm. successful Western of the decade, um, yeah. and the biggest wow. domestic box office hit of nineteen seventy four. Mm. And I think, I think yeah. in retrospect, a lot of fans of serious Western. I think you know, we prefer the serious Western. Um, Look back and kind of blamed it for for ruining. <laughs> You know, all those so, so many of those cliches, which for some reason people took seriously, and still do take a lot of them seriously. Um, you, you, it's impossible to, impossible to see them in the same light again after Lady Seven. Just blew them away. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, that brings us to the end of it. So that was seven uh, seven funny westerns for you. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, did you enjoy it, fellas? Very much. Thank you. Yes. Not really. No, no, no well, that's what, that's what happens when we get an old uh, prog rock rock star. <laughs> 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 so from, from Mr. Lyons and Frank Zappa, uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, I like that Willie the Pimp. I'm not sure about the rest of it, but... Uh, <laughs> okay, you can go and chill out with Captain Beefheart now. And... Um, <laughs> No, thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining us um, for this podcast. Uh, laugh first, shoot later. And um, we will see you again. So from Kevin Lyons. 
Bye. And from Kevin Grant. Bye. Wow. <laughs> and uh, it's goodbye from me. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.